Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I am your host, Catherine Hadro, in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thank you for joining us. In this week's show, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen's canonization cause moves forward because Pope Francis just approved a pro-life miracle. We speak with the mother of the miracle baby. We speak out against backlash facing Canadian theaters who plan to show the unplanned movie. And this. It's a journey that you never forget. It's, it's just amazing. One great grandmother explains her legacy of life and love as she's celebrated in her town for having 171 direct descendants. But first, our top story, more than 100 members of Congress are urging the Health and Human Services Department to finalize a pro-life rule which would end a hidden abortion surcharge put into place during the Obama administration. 25 U.S. Senators and 103 members of the House of Representatives sent a letter last week to HHS Secretary Alex Azar calling for a, quote, swift finalization of the proposed pro-life rule. The rule, being called the Patient Protection Rule, would direct insurers selling Affordable Care Act or Obamacare insurance plans that cover elective abortion to collect a separate payment from enrollees for that coverage. It is required by law, but during the Obama administration, insurers were allowed to collect these payments together in violation of clear statutory language. Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith of Mississippi led the Senate effort on this letter to Secretary Azar. She joins us now from Capitol Hill. Senator, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. How urgent is getting this pro-life patient protection rule finalized, in your opinion? Why send this letter now? Well, I tell you, it's just very important to me. It's very important to the state of Mississippi that, uh, you know, when you have hidden charges, when you have hidden things and plans like the Obamacare, some of those policies, that uh, the urgency is there to make sure that it is disclosed, that if you're paying for that, for any type of an abortion service, that we know that. And uh, that is the urgency in there, and uh, that's the reason that I wanted to be a lead sponsor on this letter. Can you explain the significance of the patient protection rule for American consumers? What would this rule mean for them? Well, this is a rule that needs to be implemented, but it would definitely expose any entity, any clinic, or any policy that covers any type, any part of the abortion process. And right now, there's some hidden things in there. And we just want clarity, we want exposure, we want that uh, you're, it's very visible in what you're paying for. So, you know, when it's intended to hide, that's when we have to come in and demand transparency. I know we might be getting into the weeds and the technicalities of insurance plans, which some might find that overwhelming, but this rule is meant to promote transparency, as you said, regarding taxpayer funding of abortion. But, Senator, doesn't the Hyde Amendment prevent the taxpayer funding of abortion in the first place? That's exactly what the Hyde Amendment is intended to do, that there's not any hard-earned taxpayer dollars that would go toward providing any abortion anywhere in this country. And, uh, you know, we don't want that circumvented in any way. And the president and his administration has come in and they've lived up to their promises. They are trying to fully implement the Hyde amendment, an amendment that there would be no dodging that, there would be no way around that, that would, it would not be circumvented at all, but would stand just as it uh, has intended to and has it's done for many years. Senator, the letter that you led to HHS Secretary Alex Azar calls for the finalized patient protection rule to, quote, clearly acknowledge the illegality and extent of this executive overreach in the prior regulation. Can you clarify what is meant by that? Well, it's just exactly what it says, that we want it to be transparent. And if there's any patient funding that is going to these abortion providers, that we would know that, and uh, that the Hyde Amendment would certainly be carried out as it was intended to be. And uh, again, no circumventing that, that the uh, just transparency would be very clear, and that they would have to provide the documentation to let you know exactly what it's being paid for. 
And finally, Senator, you also recently wrote an opinion piece for a Mississippi publication, The Clarion Ledger, highlighting the importance of the appropriations process for the pro-life cause. Why is that important for the pro-life movement today in Congress? Well, everybody's familiar with Planned Parenthood. And the fact that we are funding that at all is just a disgrace to start with. You know, they are the largest provider of abortions in this country. And, you know, they come under the disguise of we're doing other things for women's health. But the biggest part of it is abortions. I don't think that they should be funded at all with federal tax dollars. And, you know, it's connected to so many other appropriation bills that uh, they put it in there to dilute that, that uh, you really, it's not clear exactly what it's paying for. But, uh, you know, we should not be paying for that, the abortions there. And uh, it's very important to Mississippians. I'm here to protect all life. And the sanctity of life is just that. I think every fetus has the right to be born. You know, the only difference between you and I is we were allowed to stay in our mother's womb until we fully matured for a birth. And that is uh, why I am here, that every fetus has the right to be born, and that certainly we are letting the laws stand that are currently on the books, but I want to totally defund Planned Parenthood. Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith of Mississippi, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you. Joining us in studio for pro-life analysis is Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and today the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony list. It's great to have you. Good to be here. Thanks for being here. Congresswoman, can you break down this proposed rule for us? What would the patient protection rule do exactly? Well, it would give transparency, which we absolutely need, on whether or not enrollees are subsidizing abortion uh, when they purchase their plans. And it actually would be enforcing the law. Because Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, call for a separate payment uh, if people were purchasing a plan that covered elective abortion. So this is really enforcing the law and giving people much needed transparency so they don't unwittingly subsidize abortion. But isn't taxpayer funded abortion already illegal with the Hyde Amendment? Well, unfortunately, the Hyde Amendment does not apply to Obamacare, which of course is funded by taxpayers. So that's the downside of that. So we need this rule to enforce the law, to give people transparency. And if you'll remember, uh, we were saying at the time, Obamacare was the largest expansion of abortion since Roe v. Wade. What a sobering thought. And you might remember that at the very end, Bart Stupak, Congressman Bart Stupak, and other Democrats that had previously been pro-life caved on this issue, mm -hmm. Obamacare that included taxpayer funding of abortion. So Congresswoman, is it possible that some of our pro-life viewers, unbeknownst to them, chose a health care plan that does cover abortion on demand? And if so, how do they avoid that? Yes, it is possible. When we look at the plans that are offered under Obamacare, 24 states allow for coverage for elective abortion. And out of those 24 states, 10 states have like 85% of their plans that cover elective abortion. And seven states, every plan covers elective abortion. So consumers need to know this. Enrollees need to know this. And, and they can go to a website, mm. Obamacare Abortion, uh, this has been developed by our scholars at Charlotte Lozier Institute and the great folks at the Family Research Council. They're scrutinizing all these plans and a consumer, a purchaser of the plan, can look at this website, it's interactive, and they can determine whether or not they would be subsidizing abortion. And this new rule under this administration calls for a separate payment, which goes back to the statutory language mm -hmm. enforcing the law saying if you're going to purchase elective abortion in your plan, you have to do a separate payment. So we need to have this done before open enrollment in November so the insurers will comply with the law.
Do you expect that we will see this pro-life rule finalized? I hope it's finalized. I applaud the action of the Trump administration, mm -hmm. Secretary Azar. This is something that needs to be done. The law originally called for separate payments. That's what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. So people do not unwittingly subsidize abortion. As you mentioned, Congresswoman, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, was the largest expansion of taxpayer-funded abortion on demand since Roe v. Wade. What other action would you like to see be done in Congress to change that? Well, the law has to be changed. It absolutely has to be changed. We're grateful for this action now with this rule. We're hopeful it will be finalized soon, but we need congressional action mm -hmm. to address this. Again, taxpayer funding of abortion in Obamacare. And finally, in other alarming news this week, the National Education Association announced it voted to take a position in support of, quote, a fundamental right to abortion. Congresswoman, what's your reaction to this? Incredulity. I, I can hardly believe it. My husband was a teacher for much of his uh, career life. Uh, we have a daughter that's a teacher. Why in the world would a teacher's organization promote abortion? I mean, don't they see the students in their classroom? I mean, I, I don't understand this. But when you look at their political activity, over 90% of their support goes for Democrats. And right now, unfortunately, it's heartbreaking. The Democratic Party has become so extreme on abortion. What terrible timing for the NEA when the people running for president on the Democrat ticket are even for infanticide late-term abortion, taxpayer funding of abortion, all those things. What a time to side with the pro-abortion lobby. I'm very disappointed in the National Education Association, and quite frankly, I don't understand their logic at all. Well, I'm grateful we have your insight and analysis to join us to react to this news. Marilyn Musgrave, the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you. It's always good to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Over 125 members of Congress are asking the Trump administration to finalize a pro-life rule that would clarify how abortion coverage is listed in health care plans under the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. The rule would require separate payments and accounts for elective abortion coverage in Obama health care plans. Because even though that is the law, it hasn't been interpreted that way up to this point. The new pro-life patient protection rule would change that. And that brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell President Trump and Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar to finalize the proposed patient protection rule. When you get to our website, ProLifeWeekly.com, you'll be able to fill out your information and deliver this pro-life message directly to President Trump and Secretary Azar. American consumers deserve transparent information about the hidden abortion surcharge and the opportunity to avoid plans that cover abortion during the 2020 open enrollment period. Pro-life consumers will be protected when this proposed rule is finalized. So let's make sure our voice is heard. Send your message by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to our next segment, Pope Francis approves a miracle advancing the canonization cause for Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Forward. And the miracle behind it is a pro-life one. On September 16, 2010, baby James Fulton Ingstrom of Washington, Illinois, was born without a heartbeat and did not have a pulse for 61 minutes. His parents immediately sought the intercession of Fulton Sheen and baby James came back to life. Pope Francis officially approved this miracle just days ago, meaning Archbishop Sheen will be beatified a saint at a yet to be announced date. Sheen was a beloved television catechist during the 1950s and 1960s in the United States. His Emmy Award winning television show, Life is Worth Living, reached an audience of millions. And joining us now is the mother of that miracle baby, Bonnie Ingstrom. She speaks to us from Washington, Illinois, just outside of Peoria, Fulton Sheen's hometown. Bonnie, first off, how did you first hear Pope Francis approved your son's miracle, thus advancing Archbishop Fulton Sheen's canonization cause forward? Um, I was I was tagged by a friend on a online article, which is hilarious, but I was asleep when the news came. And so I, you know, a friend woke me up, it made my phone vibrate. And then, yeah, it just rolled from there. It was great. 
<laughs> That's 2019 for you. Bonnie, I yes. want to talk about the miracle and your miracle baby son, James Fulton. I understand it all began at your home in 2010 when you opted for an at-home birth for your son. Things were going smoothly. And then what happened, Bonnie? So, like you said, everything was great. But we did not know that there was a tightly tied true knot in James's umbilical cord. And so when he was delivered, he was, I mean, basically he was a stillborn. Mm -hmm. He was blue, he did not move, he was not breathing, and we could not find a pulse anywhere. Um, so our midwife immediately began CPR, and my husband did an emergency baptism, and you know we called 911. And then what happened from there? What did the paramedics say? Well, I mean, everyone was really scared. We had a friend who was present and she was a nurse on the pediatric intensive care floor. And she later told me that she had never seen a baby look like James, except for when she carried one to the morgue. And so and everyone was afraid. Mm -hmm. Everyone just they were hoping and praying for the best, but I think they were expecting the worst. And then you and your husband felt called to ask for Fulton Sheen's intercession. Um, what happened from there? Tell us how Fulton Sheen came into play for your son's birth. Sure, yes. Yeah. So we knew that we were going to name our son after Fulton Sheen. And for days and months, we had been already calling on him for his intercession in the life of our unborn child. And so I really think that just in this moment where we were going into shock, there was nothing that we could really formulate in our minds. We just, you know, we didn't know what to do. And I think it was just relying on that habit of calling on Fulton Sheen to pray for us. And so that's what we did in that moment. Um, and, you know, as the ambulance took James to the emergency room, as the doctors tried to revive him in the emergency room, you know, we just, we just hoped and prayed for the best and trusted in God. And 61 minutes passed. Tell us about the miracle that then occurred. Yes. So um, everything that the doctors tried to restart James's heart it, heart, it did not work. And so they finally took all hands off so that they could call time of death. And in that moment, when every window of opportunity had closed, his heart started to beat. It shot right up to 148 beats per minute, which is a healthy heart rate for a newborn baby, and it never stopped again. Then, of course, mm. the doctors, they expected massive organ failure. They expected for James to die again because you can't go 61 minutes without a heartbeat and be okay. But he didn't, and he just got better and better and hit his milestones as a baby. It's amazing. And now he's an eight-year-old boy. And how Normal. is he doing today? He's great. He just made his first communion this past spring. Um, you know, he's just, he's a, an eight-year-old boy. He can be wonderful. He can be a stinker. Um, he loves Star Wars. He loves fishing, chicken nuggets. I mean, it's great. Thank you for sharing that miracle with us, Bonnie. I imagine that was probably the most difficult day. Uh, and something that strikes me is that Archbishop Sheen is known for his evangelization and preaching on television. So what did prompt you to ask for his intercession for your newborn son in that moment? Like I said, we had already encountered Fulton Sheen. We actually were watching YouTube videos of him while I was pregnant and we were so taken by him that, and we knew his cause was open in our home diocese, the Diocese of Peoria. Mm -hmm. And so we just thought, oh, it'll be so cool if our boy is named after this future saint. Um, and that was really the beginning of us, you know, calling on him for his intercession and, and building that habit of kind of bringing him into our life and into our daily prayers. So it was, I really think it was the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. who was just leading us down that path and kind of setting the table for everything that was to come. Absolutely. Bonnie, the canonization cause for a few recently named saints, St. Pope Paul VI, soon to be St. John Henry Newman, and now Fulton Sheen, all involved a miracle with a baby. What do you take away from that? You know, babies are gifts. They are only mm -hmm. gifts. They are always gifts. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so beautiful that um, the Lord is using his saints 
to work these miracles that just remind us over and over again that even the littlest ones matter. They are precious. Mm. They're valuable. And that he can speak um, passionately and loudly and that we can promote his glory through the smallest, the smallest ones. You know, they can be the biggest miracles. It's beautiful. And as a mother of eight, you are truly a witness to that. Uh, I understand, Bonnie, that experts and theologians had to approve James's miracle. What did that process entail? Well, all I know is um, we did an investigation. There was a tribunal that the Diocese of Peoria and the Sheen Foundation did here in Peoria, Illinois. And so they you know, interviewed witnesses. They looked at all the medical records. And then they shipped all of that documentation over to Rome. And that information was then presented to the medical experts and the theologians who advised the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. And they, you know, poured over every detail. The medical experts actually, they asked us for an update. Several years had gone by, so we had to take James back to the doctor and get some more um, just reports on his health and to prove that, yeah, he really is doing well, um, defying everything that, um, you know, medicine and science would tell us should have happened to him. So, yeah, once they reviewed all of that, they uh, unanimously approved it as a medical miracle through the intercession of Fulton Sheen. Praise God. And Amen. Fi finally, Bonnie, what is this like for you and your family knowing that your son's birth will forever be weaved in with the story of a saint? It makes me speechless. <laughs> um, it's amazing. It feels so exciting. And at the same time, I think we just feel really small mm. and in the best way. You know, this miracle is not about us. This miracle is about God. Mm. It, you know, Jesus Christ is the one who conquered death. He's the one who brought James back to life. And all of this is for God's glory. We're just able to kind of tell the story. Well, your witness and your miracle is a reminder that the saints are there to intercede for families welcoming in new life. Bonnie Ingstrom, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy. It was my joy. And you can read all the details about the miracle in the forthcoming book, 61 Minutes to a Miracle, when we come back. Every, every minute of working with a family, a large family, is, is the best thing. Meet the Catholic great-grandmother with 171 direct descendants who shares why family is key to a culture of life. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro Life Weekly. I'm your host, Katherine Hadro. It's reported at least two Canadian movie theaters will not be showing the movie Unplanned after receiving death threats. That is this week's Speak Out segment. The pro-life movie Unplanned, which was a success in the U.S., is set to release in Canada this week. But at least two theaters had to reverse course and announce they will not show it because of personal threats made via social media. According to Canadian publication Cam Loops This Week for one of the theaters, there was an effort to dox the general manager. Doxing someone means sharing the personal information of a targeted person. The theater owner should not be criticized for having to have made this decision, but it's a decision that never should have had to be made in the first place. But because the side of choice is suddenly against choices, even at the cinema, safety had to be made a priority. For its opening weekend in the U.S., the movie Unplanned landed within the top five spots at the box office. It powerfully tells the true story of Abby Johnson's conversion from Planned Parenthood director to pro-life leader. And if this Canadian theater threat tells us anything, it's that the film is so effective at changing hearts and minds, critics are afraid of people seeing it. Fortunately, if your theater won't show it, the film will be available for DVD purchase just next month. Remember, there is always something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell President Trump and Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar to finalize the proposed patient protection rule. Family is the building block of society, and recently one woman's great contributions to family and society were recognized in her own town. Here's this week's Pro-Life Focus. 
it's an experience. It's a journey that you never forget. It's it's just amazing. At 86 years old, Rosemary Byrne has lived the greatest adventure. She's a mother, grandmother, and great grandmother to so many babies. It can be hard to keep it all straight at times. Patty, Colleen, Teresa, Rob, Paul, Marianne, Kathy, Mark, Jeff, and Lisa. Oh, and Chris. I'm sorry, my Chris is here. <laughs> oh, my, ba my baby. <laughs> sorry, Chris. If you kept count, that's 11 biological children. Married at 17 and today a widow, Byrne is also the grandmother to more than 70 grandchildren and over 80 great-grandchildren. It all adds up to 171 direct descendants and counting. You have these babies and they're precious from the time they're out of your womb. And they're, they're work, you have, you know, there's work, there's crosses, but by the end of the day, you know, they're, they're friends and they're the best of friends. Her life-giving legacy puts Rosemary in an increasingly small club of large families. She's seen as an icon in her longtime hometown of Heightstown, New Jersey. And this past Memorial Day was surprised with an honorary proclamation by her mayor. I was shocked with that, yes. He told the people standing out on my sidewalk, she may not be the mayor of Heightstown, but she's the mayor of Stockton Street. I never knew that. She's also since received a letter from President Trump. Not one drawn to the spotlight, New Jersey's Rosemary Byrne hopes the recent honor highlights the life issue. I don't like to be the center of a Tension that I've never been that way. And doing this is a big thing for me to have to, you know, do. But it's for, you know, the abortion issue. There's nothing more precious, you know, than a child. It's a conviction driven by the family's devout Catholic faith, something this great grandmother says was crucial in their home. How did you lean on your Catholic faith as you were raising well, and growing your family? Well, yeah. Well, we always get kept God at the center. Always, always, always. And uh, the rosary, a big part of all the families. It's so important, so important. She's the glue that keeps our family together. Truly the glue. She's the heart. Mark Byrne is Rosemary's eighth child. Growing up with a lot of siblings, he says, was the biggest blessing. There was happiness. There was always, always something. You never have a loss for friends. Family, friends come and go. Family is always there. So um, if I had to say one thing to the folks out there have children have families and it's a, it's a blessing of my life my family so while a mother's actions often go unnoticed and unrecognized this hometown hero's honor reminds us all that families should be celebrated raising a family uh it's it's hard but you know it's every every minute of working with a family a large fan is it's the best thing. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro Life Weekly. Until next time, be sure to reach us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or connect with us on social media. Just search for EWTN Pro Life on all the major platforms. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.